We're going to talk about fibromyalgia today, which is actually one of my favorite uh, diseases to talk about because it reflects the inevitable movement of all diseases known to humankind under the auspices of neurology. So just like schizophrenia and autism started out as diseases that were thought to be psychological or emotionally based or based on bad parenting or something like this and have now moved clearly under the, under the categorization of a neurologic disorder related to brain dysfunction, fibromyalgia has had the same course. So when I was in training, the controversy about whether or not it represented anything more than a psychiatric disorder was just heating up and there were a, a small cadre of rheumatologists uh, working with the American College of Rheumatology that were fighting to sort of designate it as a disease that had biological, uh, biological at least predilection, if not pathophysi full pathophysiology. And now, 25 years later, the pain community and rheumatology community generally accept that. And ironically, some of the people who were back fighting for it to be recognized as a disease are now on record saying that they're concerned that the, the common psychological uh, consequences uh, or comorbidities are not being re recognized. So we're still in the midst of this controversy, but the reality is that if, if people who do pain management particularly have to be able to discuss this disease as a disease. I'll just say one more thing about that. I just gave a lecture on palliative care at uh, Roosevelt Hospital, and after I was done, um, a physician raised his, his hand in the audience and out of the blue said, well, what do you think about fibromyalgia? And he said, I think it's psychiatric, although I know people are telling me different. And I said, you have to get off that and recognize that there's a lot of evidence now that this is a brain disease, or at least a central nervous system disease. And then I met him in the elevator after the lecture, and he said, I understand your point of view, but I don't believe it. So. That's sort of the status of this disease from the medical sociology perspective. It's very interesting. So I'll well, let's talk a little bit about what it is. It's uh, uh, the prevalence of this disorder, this chronic painful disorder, is quite high. Uh, Population-based studies have said that it's as much as 2% uh, of the general population with a preponderance in women. Uh, in 2007, there was a survey of over 2,500 fibromyalgia patients and, and found that most of them are still going to rheumatologists, uh, even though it's uh, categorically not a rheumatological disease. It has uh, the, the fact that patients like this have gone to rheumatologists represent a historical peculiarity related to the fact that people who have rheumatologic diseases have pain. Uh, that's widespread. And so that patients who have pain that's widespread went to rheumatologists, even though there's no um, there's no uh, subsequent uh, finding to suggest that it's rheumatological disease. It is, however, a very common disease in rheumatology, second most common disorder in rheumatological practices. This survey of over 2,500 fibromyalgia patients in 2007 found um, that the implications of fibromyalgia are profound, and again, suggesting the importance of it, that it needs to be addressed in the medical community, not as a, uh, uh, as a disease of, of minimal import, even if it's prevalent. It's both prevalent and has import in terms of the, uh, the personal consequences and the social consequences. So these patients reported um, a high prevalence of difficulty handling their own lives in terms of performing normal ADLs and doing housework. 20% were filing disability claims. 46% had seen three to six um, providers before receiving a diagnosis. 50% had had over five physician visits during the past year. Um, and, and patients were routinely spending large amounts of money trying to feel better. Um, this is also uh, uh, another survey uh, suggesting the impact of fibromyalgia on quality of life. Uh, this, uh, this was using the SF36, which is a very commonly used measure of health-related uh, health, health related quality of life or health status. And if you're looking at physical functioning, physical role limitations, general health perception, mental health, emotional role limitations, vitality or social functioning, a population of fibromyalgia patients, 529 of them had scores that were significantly different than, norm, than norms uh, for women in the United States. 
So um, who has fibromyalgia? Why do we think fibromyalgia now is better characterized as a, as a, uh, a disease that has a preponderant, a, a pre preponderant uh, biological uh, underpinning? Um, so there's lots of different ways to look at it. One way of looking at it is what factors predispose to uh, uh, the disorder. So we know, for example, that it runs in families. It's, um, the odds ratio for, for uh, first degree relatives is 8.5. Uh, we know that it uh, co-aggregates with mood disorders in families, so patients who have fibromyalgia are more likely to have uh, first-degree or second-degree relatives with major depression. Uh, we also know that, there, that uh, with many of these chronic pain syndromes, and parenthetically this has been very nicely demonstrated with post traumatic neuralgia, there is a, um, there is a biopsychosocial diathesis model which suggests that it's that um, the biological predisposition requires some uh, constellation of, of psychological factors and setting in order to generate or in, to be associated with the disease. And that's also been suggested for fibromyalgia where you look at genetic influences but also see that patients uh, commonly report stress as a trigger. So what's the pathophysiology of fibromyalgia? Um, the first thing that needs to be noted is that you can demonstrate findings on examination that are, that are um, highly prevalent in this population of patients diagnosed as having chronic widespread pain. Uh, they have increased sensitivity to mechanical, thermal, and electrical stimuli, and they have evidence, I'll show you in a second, that this increased sensitivity is related to central nervous system processes. Um, here's, here's some of the evidence that's been coming out in the last 10 years. Um, this is using uh, neuroimaging techniques to evaluate what happens uh, to networks of neurons in the brain when patients are subjected to pain. Let me move over here. Uh, this this uh, represents a group of fibromyalgia patients. This represents patients who are given um, uh, normal patients, and this is normal patients. And the blue dot here is the pain intensity reported with pressure that is typically perceived to be non-painful. And you can see that uh, this is the pain intensity reported with an with a, um, experimental stimulus that's typically considered to be painful. And you can see that the fibromyalgia patients, when given a stimulus that's typically considered to be non-painful, report pain intensity that's as high as normal people given a stimulus that's typically considered painful. So this is, they have, they have uh, a hyperalgesic response or, a, or a hyperesthetic response that crosses over into pain. This finding is associated with changes on neuroimaging that corresponds to the findings that you see when you subject normal people to pain. So the, t the, the neuroimaging results that you get on fMRI look the same if you compare a normal person giving a noxious stimulus that everybody would agree is noxious, and when you give a fibromyalgia patient a non-noxious stimulus, the changes in brain are the same. So these are the, this is the kind of evidence that's coming out that says there's something happening at a brain level that is associated with, with um, misinterpre misinterpretation or amplification of incoming sensory input, such as incoming sensory input, which is typically non-noxious for normal people, activates brain in a pattern associated with nociception. You know what I'm saying? Okay. There's also um, evidence that's been accumulating for over 20 years that, um, that suggests that the biological underpinning of fibromyalgia uh, takes the form of neuroendocrine and immunological abnormalities. So for example, elevated uh, corticotrophin releasing hormone has been found in CSF and blood. Elevated substance P has been found in CSF in multiple studies. There's increased numbers of activated mast cells in association with um, IgG deposits and skin biopsies. And there's elevated release from mast cells of chemokines, including monocyte chemotactic protein 1 and interleukin 8 in blood. So 
you know, I'll circle back to what I said before about it not being a rheumatological disease. That probably is, it was a little too strong. There are these very recent data. These, this, this is from a very recent study. There are some very recent data to suggest that immunological dysregulation may be part of the disease in some patients. And it is true that some patients develop fibromyalgia after an, after an insult such as, um, such as um, viral infection that suggests that the insult is activating an, an immune-mediated response that's associated with chronic widespread pain. That, that in fact, is um, uh, how I first came to realize that the disease had a biological piece to it. Uh, when I was a, a resident, I was actually working with a pain specialist and, and trying to learn something about pain. And a patient walked in who told the story that she had been a policewoman and brought documentation that she had been a highly high-functioning policewoman doing what police do. And then she had the flu. And this was about a year ago. And the, the flu was associated with aches and pains that were very severe. And then the flu got better in the sense that the coryza cleared, the fever went away, the, some of the other symptoms got better, but the aches and pains in the body never, went, never got better. And so a year later, she was applying for disability from the police force and trying to seek help from pain specialists because she had so much body pain. And she said, it's just the same as when I had the flu. It never went away. So, and this was somebody with no psychiatric predisposition, you know, high functioning, no family history of psychiatric disease, it's just, and just devastated by having had the flu and the pain never went away. So that, to, that was the first indication to me that there are at least fibromyalgia, if you view it as, um, as a descriptive diagnosis that may include multiple uh, disorders, there's a disorder that's associated with some stressor like a viral infection and culminates in chronic widespread pain that doesn't ever go away. And subsequently, data like this suggests that this may be immune-mediated.